Many of you may know that I am a Muslim. And if you didn't know, now you know. Surprise. I am a Muslim, a practicing Muslim, or at least I try and practice. I also have some female members of my family, both immediate and extended, who wear the headscarf, the hijab, because they, like millions of Muslims around the world, believe it to be a religious obligation. But still, it's a choice that they made, not one I or any other man in my family made for them. And if they chose tomorrow to stop wearing the hijab, they thankfully wouldn't get lashed in the street. They certainly wouldn't be imprisoned for not wearing it. Sadly, the same always can't be said for other Muslim women living in other parts of the world. Saudi Arabia only recently eased restrictions on women's bodily freedom from dress to driving, but women are still heavily controlled there. We all know about life for women in Afghanistan under the Taliban. And then there's the quote-unquote Islamic Republic of Iran, where the hijab and a very conservative dress code have been mandatory for four decades. See, up until 1979, Iran was ruled by a royal family, by the Shah. During that time, any kind of veil was viewed as a sign of backwardness and could restrict your job opportunities, no matter how cultural or religious it may have been for some women there. At one point, under the first Shah, the veil was banned under such strict rules that police were ordered to forcibly remove them from women in public. It was during this period of Iranian history that women's dress almost became a symbol of resistance against the monarchy an integral issue in Iranian politics and society. And as the monarchy fell in 1979, the hijab even became one of the symbols of the revolution. The departure of the Shah has caused celebrations here in the capital, but it does not mean an end to the political unrest in Iran. The Ayatollah Khomeini has become the high priest of Iran. He and other religious leaders, the mullahs, interpret the Quran and its laws, Political leaders, including interim Prime Minister Barzagan, enforce them. The theocrats in charge of Iran took the country in a very different direction from 1979 onwards. By 1981, women couldn't show their arms in public. And by 1983, Iran's new parliament enforced the mandatory hijab, punishable with prison and even lashes. And then, again, women, including those who had supported the revolution, took to the streets to protest the dress code being imposed on them by the new government. How much these clothing rules, including but not limited to the hijab, have been enforced in Iran over the decades has varied, depending on who's in office. Remember this guy? Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the ultra-conservative former president of Iran. When he came into office in 2005, he officially created the so-called morality police, a sort of police unit made of men and women whose job is to monitor what Iranian women are wearing in public. Iran's current president, Ibrahim Raisi, also a conservative like Ahmadinejad, has ramped up enforcement and even passed a new law this summer that would fine women for violations. Which brings us to September when a 22-year-old Kurdish Iranian woman was arrested. On September the 13th, Masa Amini was arrested by Iran's morality police for allegedly violating the country's dress code. In this video, seen on Iranian state television, you see the police van, then a line of women, including what appears to be Masa Amini, walking into a detention center. She gestures toward her head when speaking to someone inside. Then she grabs a chair, leans forward, and then collapses. Now, no one has denied the authenticity of this particular video so far. The Iranian authorities have said there was no mistreatment and that they are conducting an investigation. According to the New York Times, Masa's uncle told an Iranian news outlet that doctors told the family she had suffered from a stroke, but that she had been healthy before the arrest three days earlier. Now, we don't know what happened before she walked into the center or what happened in the van. Whatever happened before her collapse, though, we know that Masa Amini, who was taken in by police for not following the conservative dress code to a T, collapsed in police custody and died in the hospital three days later. And it's her tragic death that has sparked historic protests across the country. Protesters have organized themselves in Iran, despite a visible crackdown by Iranian security forces, which includes mass arrests and internet disruptions. People have been chanting, women, life, freedom. They've even been heard in some places to chant death to the dictator, in reference to Iran's so-called supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei. In some cases, women have been burning headscarves as a way of protesting against the government.
These are astonishing scenes. Women defying the strict dress code rules in the streets of Iran, in public, even cutting their hair, as you can see in this video here. This is unprecedented. That's the word, unprecedented. We haven't seen scenes like this led by women right across the country, not in my lifetime. And tragically, there's been violence too. In this video, you can hear gunshots being fired as police appear to be dispersing crowds on a major street. There have been peaceful protests too, though. It's important to point that out. Here, a university in Iran, at a university in Iran, there are many women, some of them wearing hijab. There are men too, participating in the protests, chanting about unity, demanding a release of arrested students. In response over the weekend, we also saw counter protests by pro government Iranians rallying with Iranian flags and with photos of government leaders. Since the start of the protests on September the 16th, Iranian officials say there have been more than a thousand arrests, and state media says at least 40 people have died, most of them protesters, but some police as well. To call the situation in Iran right now volatile is an understatement. These are, as I say, historic protests, and we don't know where they will lead. But for a moment, let's put the protests and the protesters to one side, because there's also been no shortage of people, parties, outside actors who are using these protests to push their own narratives about what happened and what needs to happen next. People jumping on their own partisan bandwagons to push their own talking points, their own self-interested, self-serving political and geopolitical agendas. Let's start with the Iranian government itself. A brutal and autocratic government is doing what it always does, blaming protests inside of Iran on Zionists and capitalists and the CIA. You have supporters of Israel, too, and of some of our Gulf allies using these protests to say no nuclear deal with Iran, no new deal with Iran, even though a new nuclear deal is in all of our interests. You have the US government and the European Union apparently considering further sanctions on Iran, even though the current sanctions have done massive harm to ordinary Iranian women and their families. You have some anti-regime Iranians living in the diaspora, including the former Shah's son, who often use crises inside of Iran to push for a return of the Iranian monarchy, even though most Iranians want nothing to do with their former royal family. These are flags uh, from the time of the Shah. And you have Islamophobes, of course, using these protests to bash the hijab itself and bash Islam and bash Muslims in general. Everyone wants to push their own agenda right now, their own hobby horse, while Iranian women risk their lives in the streets. It's cynical, it's shameful, above all else, it's unhelpful. For me, this isn't complicated. We should stand with Iranian women protesting for their freedom, for basic liberties, and yes, for democracy and the rule of law. I, for one, will continue to speak out against governments that ban women from wearing the hijab and against governments that force women to wear the hijab as well. How about we let women everywhere have the right to choose?